Training the mind is work. Greed, aversion, and delusion have gotten very well ensconced in the mind. And it's going to take a lot of digging to get them out. And the reason we're sitting here is because at least some of the voices in the mind say that, yes, you can do this, or yes, you can find some peace of mind this way. But when they start working, the other voices of the mind get stirred, the cynics, the ones who don't want to do the work, the ones who have an easy way out one way or another, either by doubting the teaching or by doubting your ability to practice the teachings. And yet the cynical voices do have their uses, and so a lot of the training is learning when to use them and when not. And you have to learn how to use the cynics and apply them to your greed or your aversion or your delusion or any other unskillful attitude that comes up in the mind. Those are things you really have to question. Laziness is a big one. The voices that say, you can't do this are largely motivated by a desire to be let off the hook. They say, well, I'm incapable of doing this. You know, the old story about the game leg. I've got this game leg that makes it impossible for me to do this work or that work, regardless of whether the leg is game or not. So you've got to learn how to be cynical about that, skeptical about that. The mind says, you can't do this. Well, how much effort have you put into this? How much have you really trying to do the practice? As John Lee once said, it's only four jhanas. There are people who can run corporations that have thousands of workers and own land that they develop, thousands of acres. And here we all have four jhanas, and we can't figure out where they are, what to do with them, or how to find them. It's work, but it's pleasant work. It's good work. And even the times when it's not all that pleasant, the fact that it's heading you in the right direction makes it good work. So this is when you have to bring out your, your motivating factors. Remind yourself of why this is a good thing and why you're not being asked to do anything superhuman. There is a tendency to Think of the Buddha and some of the great arahants as being superhuman, but they were human beings. And at some point in their career they had all the problems you have, and probably more. But they were able to turn themselves around, sometimes with help, and sometimes without anybody there to help them at all. I mean, the most someone else can do is provide you with advice, provide you with a good example, and create a good atmosphere. And John Fung noticed that. His students, when he was not in Bangkok, had a lot of trouble meditating on their own. But when he was there, their minds could settle down, and he realized that he had to create an atmosphere for them, and that's what he was doing. So we've tried to create the atmosphere at the monastery. This is a quiet place. People live virtuous lives here, and it creates a good environment for the practice. And there are the teachings, and there are good examples all around you. So the, as much as other people can do for you, they're doing. That's up to you to do the work, the remaining work yourself. And what are you asked to do? And then look at the Eightfold Path. Try to develop right view. Try to develop right resolve. The resolve not to stay stuck in your sensual fascinations, not to stay stuck in harming yourself or harming others, or having ill will for yourself or ill will for others. There's nothing really inhuman there or superhuman there. In some cases it takes a lot of effort. Sensuality is one of the hardest problems in the mind to overcome. But there are people who can do it. And if you, even if you don't get all the way there, the fact that you've learned to curb your sensuality 
her fascination with sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, as opposed to the qualities of rapture and well-being that can come from just inhabiting the body. It's all to the good. Right speech, right action. You have to avoid things that are harmful. Again, it's not superhuman. Right livelihood, earn your livelihood in a way that's honest. The real work comes in those last three factors of the path. There's right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. But all of these are things that you can do. What are you asked to keep in mind? Your body, your feelings, mind states, things that are right here. You keep them in mind so you can sort out what's happening in the mind, what's happening in the body. You can figure out what to do with it. This is what the right effort is, or the ardency and right mindfulness. Unskillful thought, mind states come up, okay, you learn how to drop them, drop them, drop them. If they keep coming back, you drop them some more. What usually happens is you get tired before they do, but they can wear out too. You've got to have some confidence in yourself that you are a human being, and you're being asked simply to do something human beings can do. As for skillful mind states, they're good things to develop. The mind gets clear. The mind gets sharper. This is a path where you're asked to do nothing but good things. Try to be aware of your body. Again, you're not being asked to be aware of something that's out there and abstract. It's something that's right here, right now. And it feels good to inhabit the body. It feels good to be with the breath. As for right concentration, if thinking about jhana is causing problems one way or another, you put it aside. Nobody gets into jhana by thinking about jhana. You get into right concentration by focusing on your breath, focusing on the body. You don't have to think about direct thought and evaluation. You just do it. Evaluate your breath. If it's not good, change it. Keep coming back to the breath again and again and again. Keep exploring how you can breathe in a way that feels really good, feels really gratifying. And as for the stages of concentration, they'll come on your own when you're working with a breath like this. So there's nothing superhuman about what you're doing here. It's simply that you've got to learn how to train those committee members, turn the cynical or skeptical voices on your greed, aversion, and delusion. Learn how to bring some more confidence, conviction in this path. For most of us, it's not a path that we learned about when we were growing, growing, growing up as children. It's something new. And as a result, it often can feel foreign. But what's really amazing about this path is it is something that's common to human beings all over the world. All these qualities, starting from right view to right concentration, are things that you can develop regardless of your, your background. Now, you may have different problems coming to it. And we tend to think in the West that we have some special problems that we bring to this. and Maybe in some cases we do, but a lot of times it's just the same old stuff rehashed again and again and again. You read about the people who disliked the Dharma back in the time of the Buddha, who argued with it, resisted it. And a lot of their resistance was the same sort of stuff you see now. But were they the people who benefited from hearing the Buddha? No. When they talk about these noble truths, the word ardhya also means standard or universal. They're true all over the world. It's simply a matter of 
learning how to relate to them in a way that's as natural to you as just breathing. Start with the breath. Start with your actions. Notice where you're doing things that are harmful, thinking in ways that are harmful, speaking in ways that are harmful. Figure out ways to stop causing that harm. And your thoughts and your words and your deeds will begin to fall in line with the path. It's nothing foreign. It's nothing superhuman. It is work. So you have to be very careful about those voices that tend to get lazy. There's the critical voice that says, you're not doing things well enough, and partly that's right. If you totally mastered these skills, you'd, you'd be an arahant. But the part that says you can't do this, that's the part you have to watch out for. It sounds so convincing, but it doesn't have any proof. It can point to times in the past when you've not done very well in the meditation, but that's not proof that you can't do it. One of the attitudes the Buddha has you develop is seeing that other people can do this. They're human beings. They can do it. I'm a human being. I can do it. That's the attitude you want to develop. So learn how to sort out these voices in the mind and figure out which ones to apply to which problems. Be skeptical about your cynical voices, as you should be skeptical about your greed, aversion, and delusion. There's a fair amount of aversion in the skepticism and the cynicism. And there's a lot of delusion, thinking that you'd be better off not doing the practice or resting, not driving yourself so hard. What this comes down to is you've really got to train your powers of judgment. So you judge things in a way that's helpful, and not in a way that destroys the skill you're trying to develop. So learn to look at these voices from all sides. They have their uses, and they have their abuses. And when you can sort out, okay, they're not totally bad or totally good. That's when you can start to depend on yourself in the path.